from my understanding um, of, of your book, cancer could be seen as uh, not a case of damaged cells randomly running amok, but uh, brought about by ancient, but basically something changes in the cell, which brings about um, a, a, an, an ancient historical, uh, well-organized and efficient survival response. So that yeah. the cell reverts to a primeval state that it would have right. back in its genetic, you know, back in lo lo long ago. Right. Um, so um, th this, uh, you're quite right, and you've explained uh, very well the ideas that I've uh, been developing, and uh, now it's become a big international enterprise, including people here in uh, Sydney who are working on this. Uh, Great. And, um, Great. and it, all, it, all re it started for me with a the realization that cancer is not limited to humans. It's found pretty much across the whole multicellular realm. And so all birds, fish, insects, uh, plants even get cancer, even fungi, uh, corals, you know, you can see cancer or cancer-like phenomena in all of these things. And so anything that is that pervasive obviously has very deep evolutionary roots. And you can ask, well, when in history uh, did multicellularity arise and the answer is well more than once actually but uh, starting at about one and a half billion years ago and so this suggested to me that cancer is um, uh, a sort of toolkit of uh, genes that cells have which date back from this very early time and that cancer is a, like a reversion to a more primitive state, it may be all the way back to unicellular. In some aspects, uh, cancer behaves like the unicellular world that predated the multicellular world. In some cases, it looks a little bit more organized. It looks like it's on the cusp between the unicellular and multicellular worlds. And uh, this has become uh, very much a hot topic, as I told you. So just recently, uh, the work of uh, David Good and Anna Trigos at the Peter Mac Cancer Research Center in Melbourne has shown that um, it's not just a straight switch off the multicellular genes and switch on the unicellular genes. It's more a more nuanced picture where the gene networks that regulate the uh, unicellular activity, so it's very ancient, go back over three billion years, and the multicellular gene networks, which are more recently evolved in the last billion years or so, uh, they, they become progressively decoupled. So uh, this, uh, it's not a straight reversion, it's really a sequence of um, uh, throwbacks, if you like, of going back uh, to an earlier, an earlier stage. And I think it's well recognized in the cancer research community that cancer cells are a bit like stem cells. Uh, that that well, I should explain that. Stem cells have the power to uh, create any different type of cells. So uh, if you get a totipotent, as it's called, stem cell, it can turn into you know, liver, and lung, uh, skin, whatever. Uh, but when that differentiation is completed, uh, that's supposed to be a, a fixed end point. And what happens in cancer is you get to go the other way. You get a, the arrow goes backwards, you get a de-differentiation, you get a, a reversion from uh, these more specialized cells to less specialized, more stem-like cells. And that's a bit like going back into the, into the past. So we've developed uh, this theory in quite some detail and very unusual in biology that uh, physicists are used to making uh, predictions. They sit down, uh, look at their equations and they say, go measure this or look for that and I predict you will see A and not B. That's the great power of physics. It doesn't happen very often in biology, but it does happen here. And that's because of a subject known as phylostratigraphy. Uh, so this uh, uh, blossomed during the time that I've been kicking these ideas around in the last 10 years or so. Uh, and what it means, it's a frightening sounding word, what it means is um, doing for genes what uh, ge geologists do for rock strata, uh, that you can uh, sort of, just as you go down through a geological sequence and see more and more ancient layers. So you can do the same. If you look at the great tree of life, you look at uh, the genome sequences as they're available now, for thousands and thousands of species, and you look for common genes. Uh, we share, I don't know, 98.5% of our genes with chimpanzees, for example. So you can do these sorts of analyses, and then you can um, 
use that to infer the date, the branch points, how far back did we branch from mushrooms or something, you know, pick your favorite organism. And uh, phylostratigraphy can give you the answer. So then you can apply this to cancer genes. If you give me your favorite cancer gene, uh, these people I collaborate with can tell you, oh, that one's uh, you know, two and a half billion years old, or that one's uh, 400 million years old, something like that. Um, and so we can be quite precise and say that as cancer progresses, it should uh, upregulate uh, the older genes and downregulate the newer genes. And sure enough, this, you, know, you can test this, and it turns out that these uh, predictions are largely correct. But the one that I think is really exciting, and was just recently the subject of a, well, just last week, the subject of a paper in the journal Science by a group at the Garvin Institute uh, here in Sydney. Uh, this uh, is some work that uh, we initiated a few years ago. We discovered uh, that there's a, uh, a very a famous uh, response, an atavistic response that bacteria still use. So this uh, dates way back. Uh, and let me just take you through this. Uh, life on Earth uh, has been around for at least three and a half billion years. Uh, and for most of that time, it was unicellular. Now, when life began, it had but one imperative, which is replicate, replicate, replicate. These are just single cells that were, in a sense, immortal because they could just go on splitting and splitting and making more of themselves. Multicellularity was a very different way of doing life because in a multicellular organism, most of the cells give up on their bid for immortality. They outsource that part to the, to the germ line, the germ cells, like the eggs and the sperm. Uh, so they carry uh, the immortality into the future generations. The rest of the cells uh, undergo apoptosis or uh, cell suicide when they are past their due date, surplus to requirements. Cancer is a breakdown of that contract between the so-called somatic cells, the ones in the body that uh, don't have that immortality, uh, and the germline. So, the, so cancer is a bid for ancient immortality. Uh, and so uh, cells have, single cells have had a long time to learn how to combat insults to their integrity, to their proliferative ability, their ability to replicate. And one of the things that, uh, that cells learned a long time ago, as we know from dating their genes, uh, is that if they're in trouble, they can turn up their rate of mutation. So we, I think everybody knows cancer uh, genomes are very highly mutated. You look at the tumor, sequence the, the genes, you see they're a total uh, genomic mess. Uh, and so people tend to identify cancer with these uh, mutations. Uh, but uh, what we've discovered is that cancer can, uh, the cells can actually tune their rate of mutation. They can deliberately turn up their own uh, mutation rate, the self-inflicted damage, and they do this as a means of uh, getting out of trouble. So bacteria, when they're stressed, can undergo these mutations to find uh, other sources of food, for example. It's called stress-induced mutagenesis. And we found some years ago that the uh, oncogenes, older than about, these are the cancer genes, older than about 900 million years, um, cluster uh, there's a subcluster around the homologs that's the equivalent of the bacterial genes that control this stress-induced mutagenesis. So a lot of what you see in cancer with these mutations, it's not that the mutations are caused by some damaging agent like radiation, and that causes the cancer. So cells are actually deliberately turning up their own mutation rate. Uh, so cancer is almost like a defense mechanism that cells use when they're in a bad place. So there's carcinogens or hypoxia, low oxygen. They think, uh, ah, well, I know what to do here. Done this for three and a half billion years. Just turn up the mutation rate and look for a way out of this trouble. And they do that with chemotherapy too. They, they've been bombarded with toxins and they think, right, we know what to do. Uh, we just mutate out of trouble. Uh, and that's part of the difficulty of attacking cancer. So could, it, could chemo actually uh, exacerbate um, the cancer because yes, yes, that doesn't sound good at all. No, uh, and I'm an advocate of uh, getting away from the uh, standard of care, which is maximum tolerable dose. 
uh, where you sort of bring the patient to death's door in the hope of killing the cancer before you kill the patient. Uh, it's, it's brutal, uh, it's uh, unpleasant, and I think it's actually counterproductive, though I must caution, and I always do, that I am a theoretical physicist, I'm not a physician, uh, and I can't give medical advice, uh, but I can overall uh, say that uh, it, it makes more sense to me uh, to do the opposite, which is minimal efficacious dose, that is, uh, if it's chemotherapy or for that matter, any treatment, uh, that try to contain the cancer. Cancer is really, it's not a, a single thing. It's more like an ecosystem. And as we know with ecosystems, if you stress them, uh, you can often have unintended consequences. So you might think, oh, we've got all these weeds, you know, let's kill the weeds. And then you find there's a super weed that just takes over. Uh, land management, uh, they've learned, people learned a long time ago that uh, it's better to just um, uh, try to sort of contain what's going on. And I think the same would be true of cancer. You don't want to provoke this stress-induced mutagenesis, this SOS response, this very atavistic, I'm going to mutate out of trouble. You don't want to provoke that if you can avoid it. You want to keep this ecosystem uh, balanced and live with it. And that's possible in 95% of cancers. Some cancers, of course, uh, if they're in the brain or something like that, uh, that's a luxury you can't afford. But most cancers, uh, say you've got a lump, you know, in your stomach, say. Uh, why is that a big deal? Why is that a death sentence? And, and the truth is, it's not on its own a death sentence. What happens is the cancer spreads around the body. It's this process called metastasis. And uh, after that happens, then the prognosis is very poor. Uh, but if you can uh, contain and manage, there's no, uh, really no reason why uh, you have to annihilate every last uh, cancer cell. And I, I work with, um, in Arizona, uh, there's uh, the Arizona uh, Cancer Evolution Center, uh, or uh, we call it ACE, uh, Arizona Center for Evolution and Cancer. Uh, and uh, uh, they're involved in clinical trials where uh, where this um, principle is is being tried. So I think it's beginning to make a, a, a bit of a difference in uh, therapy, but it, it's a long way to go. And I have to say that cancer is such a politicized disease that I think a lot of people feel um, they have a, have this natural fear. Of cancer, and if you're diagnosed with cancer, there is a tendency to think, oh, you know, I want it out of me. It's like an alien growing inside me. I've got to, got to get rid of it. You know, do whatever you can to destroy it. Uh, and I think we have to just get to a different mindset where we think, well, actually, with, with anybody of my age is is living with a huge amount of cancer, they, and the body has uh, ways of managing those cancer cells. They're they're, they're in us. Uh, probably not in someone of your age so much. But uh, people, um, older people have got uh, cancer cells all over them and, uh, and the body has, uh, is able to manage it. And what we notice as clinical symptoms is when those natural management uh, processes, which are things like immune surveillance and tissue regulation and so on, um, when they break, break down. So it's a myth to suppose you can get rid of every cancer cell in your body. They're, they're in there anyway. Uh, and so if we just get around to thinking of it as a chronic disease, a bit like diabetes, uh, it's something that you would manage uh, and uh, extend life expectancy uh, and, uh, and, and learn to live with it, uh, I think that would be a much better outcome clinically. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, well, it's, um, it's very exciting in many ways because, you know, cancer, it, it, it would be hard to find a, a family that hasn't been touched by, you know, it's it's... Well, by, by every cancer, family, so, yeah. Every family is touched by cancer. And it is, of course, a terrible thing. It's, uh, it depends how you cut the numbers, but it looks like it's uh, either the number one or certainly number two uh, killer worldwide. It's not just one of these things that is restricted to affluent countries where we're mm. living too long. Anyway, um, it's actually uh, really bad in developing countries. Uh, we just don't test it as much. <laughs> how to like in in poor countries like they may not have the resources to actually identify these things you know like with the coronavirus today they may not have as many cases because they're not testing 
Yeah, but, but, but uh, that, and that's true. But uh, even if you take the identified cases, it's still huge in mm -hmm. those countries. They're growing all the time. Uh, and there are, there are lots of things we can do, I have to say, it's a bit of a digression, uh, other than uh, just going easy on the treatment. Uh, there's, uh, we, we don't really spend nearly enough time with cancer prevention, because a lot of the issues here are lifestyle. I think we know we shouldn't smoke or sniff asbestos or lie in the sun uh, too much. These are obvious sort of health things, although people still do all of those things. I'm not sure about the asbestos. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, uh, obesity is a, is a risk factor, alcohol is a risk factor, diet is a risk factor. So if we manage all these things, um, in terms of extending life expectancy, uh, they'd be much more efficacious than uh, hoping for the next miracle pill. Because you don't get a Nobel Prize for a good healthcare message uh, saying, you know, eat more of this and less of that. Uh, it may be a very worthy thing to do, but you don't go down in history as the person who discovered, you know, the cure for cancer. And so the lure of the cure, as I call it, um, really distorts the, uh, the funding and distorts the thinking. There's a lot of very clever people scrambling to find, you know, another pill. Um, but in terms of uh, the so-called breakthrough that we keep reading about every week, there's a breakthrough in cancer. Uh, what you're really talking about is often rather modest, and uh, it might be that uh, a, you know, a particularly nasty type of cancer, pancreatic cancer or something, life expectancy without treatment might be six months, but uh, company A has produced a pill that extends that to nine months, uh, and then company B produces a pill that extends it to 10 months, uh, and this is touted as uh, you know, B's breakthrough, uh, but we're measuring uh, uh, life prolongation in terms of weeks, if, if not months. Uh, uh, and this is very different from the image we will have of a pill that will make it go away totally, or maybe go away for 40 years or something. Such a thing is not impossible, and there are some examples, some specific cancers, where this, this is in fact the case. But generally speaking, across the board, um, most of the progress, the most dramatic progress, I would say, made against cancer in the last, uh, say, 40 years, is reduction in smoking, uh, at least among males. And you really see that in the data now, and the lung cancer data is coming down quite dramatically. So that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of progress. And some uh, uh, other stomach cancer has come down. And then the cancers you can screen for, skin cancer being the obvious uh, example, uh, we could bring that under much better control by having more regular checks because you can see it, it's on the outside. Mm. Uh, so so the, the, there are ways that we can uh, improve the outcomes, but uh, I think got to get away from that idea it's going to be some miracle pill. Yeah, I, I liked your analogy of the weeds in the garden. Um, you know, if, if your garden's teeming with, with weeds, uh, like the cure for cancer could be seen as that which just gets rid of all of them. but the trick is right. to not have any weeds in the first place, right? Um, yes. But that's, that's not as sexy, right? It's, it's not the pill that, yeah. it's, it's yes. not the one pill that cures it all, but it's just, you know, avoid, avoid these outbreaks. Yes. And from the sounds of it, these outbreaks are uh, a consequence of living. Um, DNA damage will occur regardless of what you do. Like the very nature of living is to process information and well, yes. there's, there's stuff going on and there's degradation going on and that may result in, you know, and the genetic aberration which results in this. So it's a question of how to, yeah, how to manage it. Okay, so that's right. So cancer is not going to go away because it's built into the fundamental logic of life. It's part of what multicellularity means. Uh, and, the, um, and as I've indicated, we can identify the genes that are implicated. And uh, when they're very ancient, we know they're going to be very deeply protected. And the other thing is uh, that uh, cancer never invents anything new. It just, uh, repurposes existing modalities. Uh, many of these uh, modalities or properties are important in early stage embryogenesis or in wound healing uh, because in both cases you want to have rapid uh, cell uh, proliferation, uh, you want to have uh, cell motility, cells moving around uh, and uh, often growing in low oxygen environments, and all of these things 
are hallmarks of, of cancer. So uh, the cancer, these oncogenes that I've been talking about, um, a lot of those are developmental genes that are supposed to be switched off in the adult form when they get reactivated uh, in the tumor. So, so science writer in the United States, George Johnson has described uh, tumors as the embryo's evil twin. It's like an embryo gone wrong. A lot of the genes which are regulating it are embryonic genes. And there's others associated with wound healing. It's another sort of reconfiguration, uh, rapid reconfiguration of things. Uh, so cancer is often talk, uh, described as the wound that never heals. It just goes on, you know, doing, doing more, uh, trying more and more repair, more and more patch up, and, uh, doesn't ever come to an end. Mm.